Well, could an IPO finally be in the stars for Elon Musk's SpaceX? Well, that debate has been reignited. According to Bloomberg, the company has initiated discussions about selling insider shares at a price that values SpaceX at $175 billion or more. Now, this comes amid rumblings of a possible spin-off and IPO of the company's Starlink satellite business in 2024. Now, Starlink is by far the largest revenue driver for SpaceX. Bloomberg has reported that the company is eyeing $15 billion in revenue in 2024, thanks mostly to its satellite launch business. Now, SpaceX's Starlink owns over 5,000 satellites orbiting Earth and providing high-speed internet to over 60 countries, rivaling the likes of Amazon's Project Kuiper, among others. Well, let's talk more about this with Chris Quilty, co-CEO and president of Quilty Space, a subscription-based satellite and space sector business intelligence company. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So, thank you. Talk about some of the talk about some of the interest here that you're seeing from pe- the clients that you're talking to, especially when it comes to Starlink. Yeah, so traditionally Starlink was primarily viewed as a launch company and most of the companies in the industry uh, had a very favorable view. Uh, They were lowering launch costs, increasing launch access. The shift to uh, Starlink, however, has shifted somewhat of the competitive balance. Uh, They're now competing with many of their customers that they use to launch. Uh, They're growing that business from what had been a consumer focus into many of the the core enterprise markets that sustain uh, the existing satellite communications industry. And they've been moving fast, uh, moving into areas like uh, in-flight connectivity, the maritime market, other enterprise applications. And they've also eaten into what is a large part of the the industry's business in the government. Uh, In general, uh, prior to the launch of Starlink, about two thirds of their revenue was coming from government customers. Uh, They've got some big programs that they're also working with the uh, Space Development Agency, uh, with NASA, and that'll continue to be a large part of it. But for uh, you know the rumors around IPOs or spinoffs and and the valuation discussions, uh, the value is going to come from the Starlink side of the business, and that's where they've been growing and putting a lot of their emphasis uh, in the last year or two. And as you think about how much we saw that come into play in Ukraine with the Russian invasion there, it it really does also raise some ethical questions about having so much power concentrated with one particular company. How are some of the how are you viewing some of the ethics in this when you think about Starlink's impact here and how investors are viewing that? Well, it's a tough issue, right? Um, uh, Elon Musk uh, has been mercurial, mercurial at times, uh, certainly cutting off uh, access in Ukraine was something that opened the eyes of, of many companies and many uh, government officials around uh, the access to that service, which has become pretty vital for the U.S. military and certainly Ukraine. It's a unique capability. Nobody else can offer it today, though they do have a competitor in OneWeb uh, that is starting to launch services. So there is at least one alternative. But you know, I guess the challenge here is for SpaceX, they need to walk a thin line be, between providing the service that the gu- government customers want and being sure that they don't overstep their bounds uh, in restricting that. And you've seen competitors, uh, including OneWeb and certainly Amazon as they come on, will probably make some pretty distinct policies around uh, how they provide government service to avoid that effect and in some ways to, to try to draw those customers over from Starlink. And Chris, you raise an interesting point about some of these collaborators that SpaceX had could potentially end up becoming competitors in this space. But break down the different sorts of satellites and things that we're talking about here, because you have some that are about Internet connectivity, others that, as we mentioned, in terms of military applications as well. Who are Starlink's competitors in those spaces? Uh, So on the launch side of the business, um, you've heard people bandy around the word monopoly. They're not a monopoly. There are other launch providers, uh, but they certainly have a dominant position in the market. And uh, although in the launch market, it has historically been a a fairly static uh, industry over the years, we're seeing incredible growth. I mean, just earlier this month, they took down a a nearly billion dollar contract from a competitor Telesat, that uh, had no other option but to launch on SpaceX. There just simply aren't any heavy lift launch vehicles on the market today. Now, there might be in 26 when when, uh, Telesat begins to launch. There should be. Uh, But unfortunately, uh, Amazon paid about $10 billion to buy 83 heavy lift launches. 
uh, and that's to get their Kuiper constellation on orbit. And that sucked the capacity out of the industry. So right now, if you're looking to launch anywhere from 2024 to 2027, um, you know, it, it's basically SpaceX for most customers. And then there are some foreign launch providers. You might be able to get a, a Japanese MH3 or, you know, something with India. But uh, Russia's out of the market, and the Europeans are, are struggling with bringing their new launch capability online. And in fact, they've been forced to buy launches from SpaceX, as has Amazon uh, just recently. So then, Chris, when you think about where investment goes from here, I mean, different sorts of space investment. We've been also tracking what's been happening with Virgin Galactic pulling back there. So where are the most lucrative spaces that perhaps other companies could try and get into since SpaceX is so dominant in this space, in the launch space? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say SpaceX has been an incredible boon for this industry and what they've done with launch costs. I mean, look. The reason we're undergoing a space renaissance today is that basically launch costs had been unchanged at ten dollars to $20,000 a kilogram for 50 years. And SpaceX has bringing that, brought that down. You can buy for $6,500 a kilogram, you know, a rideshare launch. You can buy an entire rocket and drive your launch costs down to, you know, about $1,500 if you launch with a Falcon Heavy. It's lowering those launch costs that have suddenly enabled people to look at business models, whether it's manufacturing in space or building a data center on the moon. And suddenly the economics work, like the launch costs have gotten to a point where new business models are possible. We just published a report and we looked at over 350 constellations that are planned. Most of these have some level of funding. Many of them are you know, uh, well on the way, uh, generating revenue. And that's going to drive about 20,000 satellites that need to get launched before the end of the decade. SpaceX is going to grab a big chunk of that. And uh, we haven't talked about Starship. Uh, that could take up a lot of capacity. But, you know, the, the problem here is right now, in the near term, we're in, we're in a bit of a constrained environment for launch. And so many of these companies that need to build out constellations, raise capital, uh, they're, uh, in, to some degree, being slowed down in their ability to get to revenue uh, because the launch environment has become so tight. Uh, the satellite communications industry, which is the largest traditional industry here, is what SpaceX is targeting uh, with the Starlink. Uh, but to put it in perspective, and I know you're going to ask the question, uh, you know, the, the rumors around valuation going up here, um, I, I can't confirm them, but I've just seen the news articles. The biggest challenge for them is that the entire satellite communications industry is only around $25 billion in revenue. And if you're looking at $150 or $170 billion valuation for Starlink, you have to square that circle with the fact that they've got a launch business that historically has been about $5 billion a year and a telecom business in Starlink that, you know, fair enough, if you take some of the largest uh, telecoms in the world from you know, NTT, Deutsche Telekom, T-Mobile, Verizon, those companies have like 110 to $180 billion valuation. So you can kind of get there if you believe they can grow to that scale. Uh, they would certainly be the first company in the, the satellite industry uh, to move out to, you know, large uh, enterprise uh, tr traditional markets that were served by terrestrial fiber. And they, in fact, mm -hmm. think and will need to compete with many of those markets if they want to grow to the size that they're projecting.